Let me begin, first of all, by expressing my uh, uh, apologies for the uh, parking situation. Uh, I don't know that I will ever be able to find my car again, personally. Um, if I don't show up in the morning, it's because I'm still looking for my car. Uh, it is a rental car, and I will have to pay for it. Um, secondly, I seriously uh, want to express my uh, deep disappointment that we do not have a dialogue this evening. Um, I have personally taken a tremendous amount of heat uh, for being uh, a Christian who attempts to point out the impropriety of holding every Muslim accountable for what every other Muslim in the world does. Uh, I understand, uh, in light of what happened in France, uh, that there would be hesitation on the part of someone to engage in a theological dialogue. The problem is there's something going on almost everywhere in the world almost every day, so if you don't have a theological dialogue because of that, you're never going to have a theological dialogue. But uh, I, I fully understand that, and I also, uh, and I think he will be surprised by this, I also understand uh, the pressure that exists upon an imam at this time in our, in our nation. For example, I am scheduled to have, and I, I hope it happens, uh, a dialogue with Dr. Yasser Qadi in January of next year. And uh, it is not a debate, it is a dialogue, and it will be uh, formatted in that way. And one of the reasons I think he's agreed to do that is because I think he recognizes that I have over the years extended a tremendous amount of effort to try to understand Islam from the perspective of the Muslim mindset. And as such, uh, I recognize that Islam is not one monolithic thing. We frequently refer to it that way. But I just want to ask my fellow Christians, please, to realize we demand the right of others of defining what we believe. Uh, I guess a conference took place today. Resolve 2016 or something, I don't know what it was, but uh, even the Pope was supposed to be there. And I had said I, I, I couldn't go to something like that unless I was debating the Pope. Uh, and this Pope might debate, I don't know, he's an interesting one. Um, but uh, I couldn't be there and just, and just uh, you know, sweep these differences under, under the rug. Uh, I, I have to be able to define what I believe in opposition to others. Um, I remember 2001, 2002, somewhere around there, uh, up at Temple Square. We used to come up during the General Conference all the time. Uh, and then Fred Phelps and his gang showed up. And I have written on the subject of homosexuality. Uh, I've debated on the subject of homosexuality. But I absolutely demand the right to differentiate myself from someone like Fred Phelps. I will not answer for his behavior because I do not have the hatred that he had in his heart. I do not behave the way that he did. And so if I demand of others that I must be able to define my own faith, how can I not turn around and then, and, and then extend the exact same um, grace and right to other people? Uh, I know that there are differing views within what is called broadly Islam on many, many issues. I've actually taken the time to read Islamic history. I'm one of the few Christians I know of that's not only read the Quran in, in numerous translations, I've learned enough Arabic to muddle through particular portions of it, uh, but I've read all of Sahih al-Bukhari, all of Sahih Muslim, uh, major portions of Jamiat Tirmidhi and uh, Sunan Abu Dawood. These are Hadith sources. I've read portions of the Hadith that the, uh, the Shiites offer as well. And many of the early tafsir, uh, tafsir literature, tafsir is commentary upon the Quran, Ibn Kathir and other people like that, Al-Qurtabi, I have invested a tremendous amount of time to try to understand Islam from an Islamic perspective and from the original sources, unlike most people on Fox News. And as a result, I know something about classical Islam. I know what classical, um, the classical law, the Sharia, was in regards to things like jihad and things like that. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that what happened in Nice violates all the, the ancient uh, uh, Sharia uh, standards in regards to jihad. I understand these things. I've taken the time to do these things. That's what's so disappointing, is that someone who then takes the time to try to tell other Christians, hey, 
don't fall into the Fox News mindset. Don't fall into the MSNBC mindset either. That's you know, two, two pits on either side. Uh, but don't fall into that mindset that every Muslim is carrying an AK-47 behind their back just waiting for you to turn so they can shoot you. That isn't true. I know Muslims who are my friends, and they call me that. And I've earned that respect, and... That's what we as Christians should be doing. It should be natural for us who follow him who is the truth to be truthful in how we deal with other people. And if our two communities cannot dialogue with one another, if we can be blacklisted, I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned that there are certain Islamic apologists out there who will never actually engage me, uh, who may be behind having scuttled this, this conversation. They may have contacted and... and said untruthful things about me or something like that, I don't, I don't know. Um, but if that's the case, if two communities cannot talk, then all they can do is fight. And our two communities don't know much about each other. How many of you here have read the entirety of the Quran? One person. Okay. If I were to ask a similarly sized Islamic group, how many of you have read the Bible, you'd have about the same percentages. We don't know each other's uh, religious texts. The vast majority of us don't know the language of Islam. We don't know, uh, I'm going to introduce it to you to a number of terms this evening. Same thing in reverse. And the result is pretty much all we know about the other side is what we've heard from our own group. And that's very rarely an accurate thing, unfortunately. And so I'm very disappointed because there are important issues to discuss and I think, it, I think what happened in Nice, what happened in France, what happened in, in Istanbul, uh, these things only increase the need for us to be discussing these things, not decrease it. And so uh, hopefully uh, my, my desire will be that the imam will take the time to maybe watch uh, this once it's posted and hear the true disappointment uh, of what we could have done and I think how we could have advanced uh, the conversation. That's what I'm trying to do around the world. Uh, I have had the opportunity of standing in the Juma Masjid in Durban, South Africa, which used to be the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, to engage in discussion on the deity of Christ with uh, a Muslim apologist by the name of Yusuf Ismail. Uh, I was in the uh, mosque in Erasmia, uh, the uh, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq Mosque in, in Erasmia, South Africa, the year before that with uh, Shabir Ali, and we were discussing the issue of salvation. Um, I think it's important that we continue to move this conversation forward. And this is a vitally important topic. So what I'm going to do is I want to present to you, as fairly as I can, um, the A, notice I almost said the, A, Muslim understanding of who Jesus is. And I think it would be the majority perspective. But you, you need to realize, you've got westernized Muslims. Uh, you've got Muslims that come from other countries that have very little Christian influence in those countries, and they, they're sometimes going to have different emphases and, and things like that. Uh, but I, I want to give you an, an accurate understanding, um, and then we can discuss that. And you might say, well, that's not fair. There's no one here to defend it. Well, I will do my best uh, to give you what kind of defenses have been offered, because I have had many opportunities of engaging folks on these very subjects in, uh, in mosques and in other situations around the world. So let's, let's start with some terms because, unfortunately, uh, there are certain, you, you really can't discuss Islamic theology without understanding a certain terms that sometimes we don't share in common. In the Christian faith, the central affirmation of our faith is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity, that God has revealed himself to exist as one, one God, one divine being shared equally and fully by three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, and neither is person being. So there's one being of God, three persons. The central affirmation of the Islamic faith around the world, whether it would be uh, Sunni or Shiite, uh, or the various other small groups that you would put in there, uh, is the concept of Tawheed. Tawhid. It comes from the Arabic wahad. It means one. If you know uh, the ancient Jewish confession called the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, that last word, Echad, uh, Hebrew is, an, is a Semitic language, Arabic is a Semitic language. They share many roots together. In fact, my Arabic is just basically uh, sort of 
bad Hebrew. <laughs> I've taught Hebrew, and so the, I sort of just bring the Hebrew over to, and sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, same root that is used for one, echad, in Deuteronomy 6.4, uh, is the root for wahad, one, and then tawhid then becomes the oneness of God. Uh, if you understand anything about the life of Muhammad, then you know that from the Islamic sources, uh, he lived as a minority prophet in Mecca from his calling uh, in 610 until uh, leaving Mecca for what is now called Medina in 622. And during that 12-year period, he was uh, very poorly treated, uh, according to the sources, at one point, for example, he was bowed in prayer and some of his enemies came along and, and draped camel entrails on his back while he was bowed and his daughter had to come along and take the, the, the material off of him. Uh, he was mocked. Uh, obviously, he was in, his life was in grave danger uh, because though he was a member of the Quraysh tribe, uh, the Quraysh tribe uh, had control over what is called the Kaaba. And in those days, the Kaaba, by tradition, had 360 idols in it. And one of the major sources of income for Mecca were pilgrims coming to worship at the Kaaba and to circumambulate the Kaaba and so on and so forth. So to become a prophet and start preaching a monotheism when your own tribe, much of its financial income came from polytheism, well, it wasn't the most popular thing in the world to do. And so many people wanted him dead. For quite some time, he was protected by his uncle Abu Talib, who was a very powerful man. And uh, I will tell you a little story about Abu Talib a little bit later on. Well, in just a moment, when I describe for you the negation of the central affirmation of, of the Muslim faith. So the, the central thing that a Muslim would say, we believe, is that Allah is one. Now, initially, that emphasis was one over against all these others. So the initial emphasis is monotheism. There is only one true God. But over time, that has also developed to where it's not just one true God, but one God in one person. So a Unitarian monotheism. I am a monotheist. There is only one true God, Yahweh. And that one God uh, has manifested himself in three divine persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, they would say, is a violation of Tawheed. And so that oneness of God, very central to Islamic thought. So the worst sin, in fact, the only unforgivable sin, according to the Quran, you can see this in Surah 4, uh, the one unforgivable sin is the violation of Tawheed, which is called shirk. Shirk, S-H-I-R-K, shirk. Now, in secular Arabic, uh, like a corporation, uh, that's the term that's used for a corporation. It's, a, it's association together. But when it comes to religious things, it is the association of anyone or anything with the worship of Allah. And so there are different kinds of shirk. There's major and minor shirk. Just there are different kinds of tawheed. Uh, tawheed in the names and attributes of God. Tawheed in his lordship. Uh, so you can violate Tawheed in different ways as well. There's different kinds of shirk. But according to the vast majority of Muslims, uh, to die as a mushrik, a person who has committed shirk, and most Muslims around the world, not all, there are, there are American Muslims uh, who do not believe that Christians are mushrikun, but for the majority of Muslims around the world, uh, they do believe that Christians, because of our worship of Jesus, and they believe Jesus is merely a prophet, a highly exalted one, a very special one, did many miracles, as I'll say in a moment, but still merely a prophet. Because of that, the vast majority of Muslims around the world believe that Christians are mushrikun. And if you die as a mushrik, uh, there is no forgiveness for you. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do so as to facilitate communication with my Muslim friends, as I mentioned, is to... Um, read uh, the major collections of what are called hadith, the ahadith literature. Uh, and the two major collections of that for Sunni Muslims are, is uh, Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. And these are the actions, sayings, uh, doings of Muhammad and his companions uh, collected 250, 300 years after the time of Muhammad uh, himself. And so uh, these are multi-volume works. Uh, I listened to them while riding my bike. Uh, that's how I do things. Um, and that actually helped me. 
Uh, I think I learned them better doing it that way because many of the uh, hadith are repeated multiple times in the collections in slightly different forms. If you were reading, as soon as you started reading the same story, you'd probably just skip over it. But since it was an MP3 format, I couldn't do that. I just, uh, I, I listened literally. There is one particular story. I don't know why it was so popular. But it was a story about a, a woman offering herself in marriage to Muhammad, and he declined. And so this man comes along and says, give her to me in marriage. And, and Muhammad says, uh, what can you give her for a dowry? And he looks around, he's got nothing. And go ask your family. And the family doesn't have, he's just so poor. That finally Muhammad says, well, have you memorized any of the Quran? Uh, well, I have. I've memorized these particular surahs. Well, I give her to you as wife for those uh, surahs of the Quran that you've memorized. I'm going to tell you something. If that story appears any less than 45 times between Bukhari and Muslim, I would be shocked. And about the 45th time, I was ready to ride off the road into a cactus to feel better because I had heard it over and over and over again. But that's a good way of learning. Uh, repetition, you know, helps you to remember things. And so uh, many of these, these uh, hadith are, are stuck in my head. And so one of the, one of the hadith that uh, is very, very well known there, there are some stories that are called mutawatir. They're universally accepted amongst the Muslims. Now, of course, you'll always find an exception someplace. But um, this one, I think, ranks right up there um, in, in its popularity. But it's the story of a Jewish man, at least in one of the versions of the story. Most of the versions don't say that, but a couple do. A Jewish man who had killed 99 people. So he was a mass murderer. And he went to a priest and asked the priest, uh, will God accept my uh, my repentance. And uh, the priest said no, so he killed the priest. So now he's killed 100 people. And so he goes to a scholar. Now, I've always said none of the stories told whether the scholar knew about the priest or not. Uh, but uh, he asks a scholar, will my repentance be accepted by God? And the scholar says, go to such and such a city uh, that is filled with, with wise and, and godly people, and they will tell you what you must do for your repentance to be accepted. And so while he's on the way to that city, the time of his death comes. In, in most Islamic thought, uh, 40 days after conception, uh, it is written down for you, whether you can be male or female, when you're going to die, whether you're going to heaven or hell, it's all written down for you. Now, there are obviously disagreements, but that's a common belief. And so a um, time came for him to die. He <laughs> drops dead in the road. And an angel comes from paradise. An angel comes from the fire to argue over his soul. Now, you would think that this is pretty much a slam dunk, uh, but the angel from paradise says, ah, but, but he was going to find out about repentance. And so Allah decrees uh, that if he is one cubit closer to the city he was going to than the city he was coming from, then he'll go to paradise. And then he causes the earth to shrink between that city and him, so he's one cubit closer, and so he goes to paradise. Now, the point being that Allah can have mercy on whom he has mercy. Now, I don't have time to develop this this evening, but uh, I discussed this issue uh, in the debate with Shabir Ali in the mosque in Erasmus in South Africa because the subject was on the issue of salvation. My, my concern about that is that God's law becomes trampled underfoot. There is a distinction, there's a ripping of how God's law represents God's very being. Uh, a ripping apart of that unity that I, I think really needs to be there and it, it causes some serious issues regarding God's righteousness in my perspective but I don't have time to develop that that evening you can go on YouTube you can listen to the uh, the dialogue between myself and Shabir Ali uh, from South Africa in 2013 on that particular subject if you'd like to but there is the idea that God can forgive anything except for shirk so in other words a violation of Tawheed, idolatry, false worship, is the worst sin you can commit. You can kill a hundred people and yet still go to paradise. But if you die as a mushrik, there is no forgiveness. And in fact, according to the Hadith sources, uh, Muhammad's parents died as mushrikun. And he asked Allah if he could pray for them and he was told he could not. And... Abu Talib, remember I mentioned Abu Talib, his uncle was on his deathbed and Abu Talib had protected Muhammad. And so Muhammad comes to him and he says, you know that I'm the prophet of God. Uh, just say the Shahada, uh, la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. Well, I'm not sure he would have added that at that particular point in history. But anyways, 
uh, say the Shahada, I will pray for you. The rest of the family is going, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, do not deny the ancestral gods. Uh, Abu Talib dies as a mushrik. He does not say the Shahada. He does not become a Muslim. And in the one exception, one exception to the rule, Muhammad is allowed to intercede for someone who died as a mushrik. And as a result, Abu Talib has the best spot in hell. Now, I always stop at that point because the look on everyone's face is, and what exactly is the best spot in hell? Uh, could you describe this for us? Um, there are different versions of the story, uh, but basically Abu Talib is wearing sandals that are so hot that his brains boil. And that's the garden spot of hell. And he only has that because Muhammad interceded for him. So do you get the idea that shirk is a bad thing? Yes, it is a very, very bad thing. And one of the major, major uh, barriers in conversing with our Muslim friends and even getting a hearing for a discussion of what we, uh, what we believe about the subject this evening is that the large majority of Muslims believe that what we believe about Jesus, if they were to accept that, would require them to commit shirk. Okay? Now, I do not believe for a second that what we actually believe about Jesus is shirk. But here's the issue. I also do not believe, having read through the Quran very carefully, this is the new study Quran, if you've seen, it's a new translation, very scholarly uh, version, lots of appendices, and this is as close as you can get to the ESV study Bible, okay, uh, as far as Quran versions go. Uh, it's actually heavy enough to smack somebody with it, uh, just like the ESV study Bible. Um, uh, having read through this literature, Ibn Kathir, the Hadith literature, I am absolutely convinced that the author of the Quran did not know what we believe about Jesus Christ. Only had a very shallow understanding of what we actually believe. Certainly did not have any first-hand uh, exposure to the serious content of the New Testament. Never heard anybody reading from the book of Colossians or Philippians chapter 2 or any of the things like that. And that's where the problem lies because... If you understand what Shirk is saying, we're not associating a created thing with God. Our belief in the deity of Christ is that the Son has eternally existed as God. He did not become God at some point in the past. He's not created. He has eternally existed as God, and he took on human flesh. It's not that we're taking something in the created order and adding it to God. We're talking about the God who has eternally existed freely entering into his own creation. That's why, again, I don't have time to develop all of it this evening, but uh, in my opinion, the, the, the very best discussion I've ever had on this subject took place in the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia in about 2011 with a young man, a young uh, Muslim scholar by the name of Abdullah Kunda. And so if you will look up Abdullah Kunda, uh, James White on YouTube, it'll pop up immediately. Uh, it was an excellent uh, discussion, very respectful and uh, Abdullah is one of the few Muslims that I know who actually read my book on the Trinity and then attempted to use that information to make his presentation more understandable. So in other words, while I, am, while I invest thousands of hours in trying to understand Islam so that I can build bridges that direction, uh, Abdullah is about the only person I know of who on the other side said, that sounds like a good idea. Let me see if I can communicate more clearly with you by reading your information and communicating with you and so you can understand what I believe better. And unfortunately, while that should be how it always is from both sides, unfortunately that's not always how it is. Uh, and the majority of the time, that's not how it is at all. And we're trying to change all of that. So, if you understand Tawheed now and you understand Shirk, then who is Jesus? In, in a standard Sunni understanding. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to say a fairly well-read Sunni understanding. Uh, uh, this would generally reflect uh, even upon what are called the Wahhabi or the Salafi Muslims, uh, who are Sunnis but are uh, very, very conservative in their perspectives, more likely to overthrow ancient traditions and various developments of Sharia. Um, but 
uh, I, I will try to, if, if I am familiar with differences, I'll try to uh, mention them to you. Jesus is a mighty prophet of God. He was sent by God. He was virgin born. Allah simply said, be, and he was. If you want to read some of the primary sections of the Quran on this, normally I would have a a digital projector and and things like that, but obviously we didn't know exactly what was going to be happening this evening. Normally when I do my presentation on Islam, and again, it's all online, look up Islam A to Z, you'll see I put all of these uh, texts. We read uh, a tremendous amount of the Quran, uh, specifically from Surahs 4, 5, and 6, especially Surahs 4 and 5, um, to allow the Quran to define for itself uh, what these things are. And uh, by the way, I think it is important, um, especially in today's world, I, I, if, if you have a desire to reach out to Muslim people, read the Quran. It's only about, it's less, it's about 57% uh, the length of the New Testament, 14% the length of the Bible. Uh, it is much shorter, and hence uh, you can get through it. Just don't try to read it from cover to cover. It won't make a lick of sense to you because it's organized on the basis of the size of the surahs, the size of the chapters. And so after Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening seven-verse prayer, uh, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Surah 2, the cow, is the longest. It's a book unto itself. And then Surah 3 is a little bit shorter, and Surah 4 is a little bit shorter, until you get down to the final surahs. There are 114 chapters or surahs in the Quran. Um, And there are only a number of uh, of verses long. So, for example, one of the most important chapters in the Quran is uh, Surah Al-Iqlas, Surah 112. Um, which contains the, the third line, Lem yelad wa lem he, is, he is be, getteth not, nor is he begotten. It's a direct refutation of the author's understanding of what Christians believe about God. It's as close as you can get to a creedal statement, really, in, in the Quran. But it's, if you read it from beginning to end, you're bouncing back and forth between different periods in Muhammad's life. And so trying to figure out what the background is and stuff like that, now, now something like this would help, um, but in my book on the Quran, I included a little, ch- a little chart that sort of gives you a, the best guess we can come up with as to the order in which the surahs were written. And if you at least read it that way, it sort of makes a little bit more sense. And then if you combine that with something like this that gives you background to each of the surahs, then it would, it would be helpful to you along those lines. Um, anyway, according to uh, Islamic belief, Jesus is a mighty prophet. His name is mentioned. He's called Risa in the Quran. And there are dozens of theories as to why because that's not his name in Arabic there are dozens of theories as to, and I've never found one that really commends itself overly well against the others but he's called basically called Riza bin Maryam the, the Jesus the son of Mary uh, his name appears 25 times in the Quran there are approximately 93 to 98 ayah, ayat or verses that are at least somewhat relevant to him or, or related to him somehow in the, in the Quran and so, uh, remember, the Quran is being written. I mean, Muhammad dies, according to traditional sources, in 632 A.D. And so this is a book that has to deal with the preexistence of the Jewish scriptures and the Christian scriptures. And so you and I are directly addressed in the pages of the Quran. So you have, uh, we are called by two primary names, uh, specifically, we are called uh, the people of the gospel, the al al Injil. And then other times we're called the al kitab the people of the book. Sometimes that's Jews, sometimes that's Christians, sometimes that's Christians and Jews together, and sometimes we can't tell. It depends on the context. But we are addressed directly. We are warned not to say three, for example. Uh, I'll get into a little bit more of that later on. But we are directly addressed, and I've always said to my audiences, I think it's very important that we should know exactly what the Quran says to us. The Quran says that if you believe, if you say three, uh, hellfire is reserved for you, and there will be no one to help you. You are to repent. You know, these are strong words. Uh, and it's, it, it's strange that the media doesn't seem to understand uh, the importance of these things. And obviously, from my perspective, uh, from, uh, if, if you're a Muslim and you believe the Quran is the actual word of God, and you need to understand, from the Muslim the, the classical Muslim perspective. Um, The Quran exists in heaven on a on a tablet and it is uncreated. In fact this creates a lot of major philosophical and theological issues. 
Uh, this is a doctrine that I think history shows very clearly developed over time. Uh, but it became Sunni orthodoxy. It's not Shiite orthodoxy, in my understanding. But it became Sunni orthodoxy that the Quran is uncreated. It is eternal. Not just in the sense that God knew it was going to exist, but that it actually had true, eternal, uncreated existence. And it came down on what's called Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power, which is, well, we're not sure exactly what night it is. Uh, it's an odd-numbered night in the last week of Ramadan. So it wasn't that long ago, uh, if you are aware of when Ramadan is. Ramadan keeps moving in our year because the Muslims use a lunar calendar and we use a solar calendar. So it moves 10 to 11 days forward in our calendar each year. Anyway, it was sent down to the angel Jibreel on Laylat al-Qadr. And then it was sort of piecemealed out to Muhammad over the next 22 years, as need be. And so... It, it, there is nothing of man in it. And one of the major differences between us as we look at how we do exegesis and how Muslims approach the Quran, when we look at 1 Corinthians, we look at the situation in Corinth, we look at who Paul was, we look at the language he was using, uh, we, we look at all this background information. If he quotes from other sources, we look at those sources and things like that. That's not really relevant in the majority of the interpretation of the Quran, because from the Islamic perspective, this is just simply God dictating his word. There's nothing of man in it. It's perfect transmission from Allah to Jibreel, from Jibreel to Muhammad, and we can't ask questions in... There are Muslims who do ask these questions, but only in the Western world, primarily. Um, what was Muhammad's understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity? Uh, how did that influence his word choices here? For the vast majority of Orthodox Sunni Muslims, that's irrelevant because they weren't his word choices in the first place. They're God's word choices. They're not Muhammad's. And so what Muhammad understood doesn't matter. And you can see how that would have a major impact on how we, uh, you know, most of my Muslim friends who uh, attempt to demonstrate problems in the New Testament rely upon liberal theology and liberal uh, worldviews uh, that bring all that information into the attack upon the New Testament. When it comes to the Quran, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't look at any of that. This, this creates a tremendously uneven playing field, shall we say, when we attempt to compare the much larger, much older Bible with the much smaller, much more recent uh, one-authored book, the Quran. Forty authors for the Bible, 1,500 years of composition, one author, uh, 32 years, traditionally, uh, 22 years, uh, traditionally, uh, for, the, uh, for the Quran. And so uh, it's very frequently is comparing apples and oranges. It, it, it really is at that particular point in time. But again, those are just some of the issues you need to keep in mind. Jesus is a mighty prophet. He's virgin born and he does miracles that even we Christians don't believe he did. Bet you didn't know that. So uh, there are materials uh, in the Quran, for example, uh, Jesus speaks from his cradle in Surah 19, uh, the only surah named after a woman, Surah Maryam. And so he speaks from his cradle and says he's a prophet of Allah, and he's speaking in defense of his mother, who is being accused of being, uh, you know, because of the virgin birth, so on and so forth. Um, now, that particular story of Jesus speaking from his cradle is not unique to the Quran. It, it, actually occurred 150 years earlier in what's called the Arabic Infancy Gospel. Um, another story is that Jesus formed clay birds and breathed on them and they became alive and flew away. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that that also comes from a Gnostic source that was hundreds of years before the Quran. And so when we point out the use of these sources, uh, very often... Uh, that raises issues because if the Quran actually has existed eternally, then why would we be utilizing pre-existing sources that are actually Gnostic or semi-Gnostic in their, in their origin and are not historical? Well, that's one of the issues that if we were having a dialogue, we could discuss, but we can't have a discussion because we're not having a dialogue. Um, so he, he performs many miracles, but he is only the Jewish Messiah. He is only sent to the people of Israel. Very often, even my best read Muslim friends will quote from Matthew chapter 15, I am sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
ignoring Matthew 28. Go ye therefore into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so they'll say, well, your own Bible says Jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, you know, I don't think I should treat the Quran that way. I don't think I should take something from the beginning of Surah 2 and put it in opposition to something that's at the end of Surah 2. And you shouldn't take something in Matthew chapter 15 and place it in opposition to something in Matthew chapter 28. Um, let Matthew be Matthew. I'll, I'll try to let the Quran be the Quran. Um, so the, the assertion, though, is that, that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. He was never intended to be a figure that was to be proclaimed to the entire world. And so many times what the Quran says to Christians is, do not commit excess in your religion. And what it means by that, it's almost always in the context saying, do not say three. By the way, the word Trinity is nowhere in the Quran. Um, the Trinity is described in the Quran. I think three is trying to describe the Trinity, but it's actually the ordinal number three. It's not the technical term that, the, uh, that Arabic Christians used at the Trinity at that time. Um, but it says, do not commit excess. And so from the Muslim perspective, what you and I have done is we've taken a true prophet of God and we have gone into excess in our veneration and worship of him. So we've gone beyond what the truth actually was. We, we need, need to come back. That's why you'll very frequently find Muslims using Jewish arguments against the New Testament is because they're basically saying, got the Old Testament, you've got the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, you've got the Quran, and the New Testament goes too far. You've gone too far. See, we, we agree on, you know, no pork and so on and so forth, and you've, you've, gone, you've gone too far. Obviously, from our perspective, we're going, you went backwards <laughs> uh, because you're missing the fulfillment aspect of what Jesus' ministry was all about. But that's what the Quran is saying. Do not go into excess. So, while Jesus is an exalted prophet, he is merely a prophet. He is a creature, virgin born. But how did he die? Well, this is where there's a lot of difference amongst Muslims. There is one ayah, one verse in the Quran, Surah 4, 157, that says the Jews boasted and said that we killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, but they killed him not, but shubiha laham, so it was made to appear to them. Now, that phrase, so it was made to appear to them, it goes on to say, but of a certainty they killed him not, they have nothing but speculation. Of a certainty, they killed him not. Now, now what does that mean? Is that, does it mean only the Jews didn't kill him? It was the Romans that killed him? Because, see, in Surah 355 in 1933, there are references to Jesus' death. So, what's being said? And it's interesting. The, the Quran claims to be mubinun, clear, easy, perspicuous, easy to understand. I sat down with my Arabic tutor, who's a native Syrian, uh, more than once. And I said, okay, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm boring you, but could we go back through Surah 4, 1 to 7? And I've asked question after question. Could it be understood this way? Could it be understood this way? What if we take the vowel points out and just look at it as a consonantal text? Could, could we interpret it this way? Could it, trying to understand specifically what is said in Surah 4, 1 to 7. Why? Because it seems contradictory to the rest of the Quran. It is completely contradictory to history itself. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, even the most radical skeptics of the Christian faith, like John Dominic Cross and Bart Ehrman, you heard Bart Ehrman mention last evening, say that the most certain aspect of Jesus' life, the most unquestionable aspect historically, is that he died on a Roman cross under Pontius Pilate. So even the skeptics go, yeah, that's a, that's a given. And so for the Quran to come along 600 years later and go, didn't happen, um, puts the Quran in direct conflict with the entirety of the historical record itself. And so what is that text saying? Well, Muslims have disagreed. And here's one of the problems. You can get no guidance from the Hadith. There is not a whisper of interpretation in the Hadith for Surah 4, 1 to 7. Now, that's pretty weird because there's all sorts of interpretation of other things. I mean, um, for example, uh, if you've ever heard the Muslim prayers, you know that in Surah uh, 
1, uh, Surat al-Fatiha, at the end, if you've ever heard the, that, that, what's called Tajweed, the, the chanting of the Quran, you can always tell when it's Surat al-Fatiha because when they come to the end, they'll go, Vala Dalim, and they'll hold out that long vowel, Dalim. And that last word that's being held out is those who have gone astray. And that last verse is, lead us in, in, do not lead us in the way of those who've earned your wrath and those who've gone astray. And there are numerous stories in the Hadith where people ask Muhammad, who, who are you, who, what does that refer to? And his response was, those who earn God's wrath, it's always the Jews. And who are those who went astray? Christians. And so whenever the Muslim does their prayers, which are done in Arabic, uh, they are praying each day not to be a Christian, or a Jew for that matter. And that being led astray part. So the point is there was all sorts of discussion in the Hadith, but when you come to Surah 4, which is 7, silence. No Muslim for 300 years could remember anything that Muhammad ever said about that verse. Pretty strange. Pretty strange. At this point, I'd go into some of the textual history of the Quran, how it was collated, how it was given. I think it's very important to address some of those issues. Don't have time this evening, but it would be a part of an interesting dialogue uh, to, to address these things because some early sources talk about major portions of the Quran being lost. And, 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 and Sahih al-Bukhari, volume, uh, volume 6, pages 509, 510, sections 509, 510, I talk about how one verse was not found in the first collation, but it was found later and put into the second collation. It really makes you wonder about this one verse that there's, just, there's no commentary on, and yet it's the one verse that requires Muslims to not believe in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And hence, if you don't have crucifixion, you don't have burial. You don't have burial, you don't have resurrection. You don't have resurrection, you don't have the gospel. And so it's a vitally important verse, and yet Muslims themselves disagree over what it means. So you'll have on the one side... The majority view is called the substitution view. That phrase, should be halaham, it was appear, made to appear to them. For the majority of Muslims around the world, and especially non-Westernized Muslims, they understand that someone else was made to look like Jesus. And someone else was put on the cross. And you can sort of guess who the prime suspect would be. Judas. Though I did receive a long email once, which when printed out was like 10 pages long in blue ink with lots of capital letters underlining and, and all sorts of... Because when you use capital letters and underlining and red ink, that proves your point, uh, which is evidently the case on the, inter in, in the uh, internet. Uh, proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was Simon the Cyrene who was crucified. So there you go. Um, that's the majority view around the world. Someone else was crucified in Jesus' place. He, the very next verse says he was Raphahu. He was taken up uh, to heaven. Um, but a lot of westernized Muslims don't go that direction. You know why? Because when you think about it, the substitution theory means God started Christianity by mistake. He did such a good job fooling everybody in putting somebody else upon the cross, an entire religion developed that has created more shirk than anything else the world's ever seen. And so a lot of my westernized Muslim friends will go, Allahu Alam, Allahu Alam, God knows, God knows. All I know is Jesus wasn't crucified. What else happened? Don't know, don't know, can't tell you. So uh, that is the second major issue in regards to Jesus is worship of Jesus shirk and did Jesus die upon the cross? Now, Islam has an incredibly um, in-depth and developed eschatology. In fact, they make us look like amateurs. And you thought, and you thought after Left Behind that no one could ever uh, <laughs> uh, get, close to, get close to us, right? Um, Seriously, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of eschatolog eschatological speculation in the Islamic world. It's not so much in the West, but in the Islamic world. And generally it is believed that Jesus will return at the head of the Islamic army. Um, the Hadith say that the, the rocks will cry out and say there's a Jew hiding behind me. Uh, Jesus will come and he'll destroy the cross and the pig. 
the cross and the pig. Many, many Muslims believe that we worship the cross, that therefore it is a, an idolatrous thing. And of course, if you look at enough uh, you know, Roman Catholicism bowing down in front of crucifixes, you could probably figure out why some would think that that's actually what's going on. Um, but Jesus will return, but as a Muslim, uh, not as the son of God, not as the king of kings, so on and so forth. And I'll, 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 I'll close my presentation as to who Jesus is by narrating uh, what is, I believe, a mutawatir hadith, a, a universally accepted hadith, that is fascinating in its, in its teaching. And that is, according to the hadith, when the day of judgment comes, uh, humanity as a whole will stand in great fear of Allah. And so they will come to the prophets and ask the prophets to intercede for them. So they'll come to Adam and they'll say, Father Adam, intercede for us before Allah. He is angry and, and we, we need someone to intercede. And, and Adam will say, I, I am not the one to do so. I sinned. Um, and so go uh, to Abraham. And so they go to Abraham and Abraham will say, go to Moses. And they go to Moses. And eventually it goes down the chain, each one saying, I'm unworthy. I sinned in such and such a way until they come to Jesus. Now, I did find one printed edition that accused Jesus of sin, but when I checked the Arabic, it didn't reflect in the Arabic. Um, so uh, I can't say that I've ever found an official, accurate edition that accused Jesus of any sin. But in this Hadith, Jesus says, I am not worthy to do this. Go to Muhammad. And so the world comes to Muhammad, and uh, Muhammad goes before Allah. He does not say, I'm unworthy to do this. Um, he goes before Allah, and Allah teaches him a special way of worship. And there are, again, different versions of this story, but uh, I'll. Muhammad intercedes for his ummah, for his people. You can make the argument from the Hadith sources that as long as someone has truly made the profession of faith, has said, La ilaha illallah wa Muhammadan Rasulullah, and become a Muslim, and there are like seven things you have to fulfill to be able to do that properly, and it has to be done in Arabic, it has to be done in four witnesses, etc., etc., but there, you could make the argument from some hadith that as long as someone has said that, they will eventually enter into paradise. They may spend a fair amount of time in the fire before they get there. It's not really a, a purgatory concept, but it is a fire concept. They even call the people the fire. They enter into paradise blackened in one, one version of the story. But Muhammad intercedes for them, and he does so multiple times until the last person who had the least bit of iman, least bit of faith, uh, comes out of the fire and enters into paradise. Um, all others, then, are condemned to eternity in the fire, which includes all those that engaged in, mush, in uh, shirk. Now, there are some hadith in Sahih al-Muslim, Sahih Muslim, I'm sorry, um, that some people reject and question their, their validity, uh, that indicate that the sins of Muslims will be placed upon Christians and Jews in their place. A concept of substitution, interestingly enough. Um, but I do know Muslims who say those are ahad, that is they have one chain of narration, and they question the validity of hadith that have only one chain of, of narration. So there's, believe me, I, I, I have burned in my memory uh, a couple years ago, uh, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I am an avid cyclist. Uh, yesterday I rode up to Brighton and Garzman Pass. And this morning I did Alta. Uh, figure out the, the, the ascent on that. That's 10,000 feet in two days. Um, I am one of those crazy uh, spandex-clad uh, people out there in the dark uh, climbing those mountains. And uh, when I live in Phoenix, uh, like as soon as I get back at the end of July, August, it's really hot in Phoenix. And what you need to understand is it's always hot in Phoenix. Um, I, I climbed South Mountain in 1996 on my bike, and that was the night we set our high, low temperature. 
So before sunrise, the coolest it got was 96 degrees uh, with high humidity, humidity almost as high as New Orleans. We're not supposed to tell people that happens in August because it's supposed to be a dry heat. It is in June. It's not in July and August. And so the only way to get a ride in in, in Phoenix is to get up literally at 2.30 in the morning and go on the road by 3. And it's amazing how much study you can get done. Uh, they're in the dark. You're not having to dodge cars, anything like that. And I remember, I don't know why I remember with such, such clarity, but I was listening to Sheikh Yasser Qadi's uh, lectures on the Hadith sciences and how you determine what a Sahih Hadith is versus uh, the lesser categories and, and things like that. And there is, it, it's extremely complicated as to how you determine uh, the, the status of these various hadith. And in many of the debates I've done, you know, I've brought up these sources, and very often my opponent said, well, I, I just don't accept that particular, that particular hadith. Okay, there's actually a movement going on right now uh, amongst Muslims who, would say, who recognize there needs to be reformation. And one of the fundamental things that always is brought up is as long as the Hadith continue to hold the position they do in the, in the interpretation of the Quran and the, in the, in the construction of Sharia, there can be no reformation. We have to have a new way of looking at Hadith. Now, of course, it's only a very, very liberal Muslim that's going to say that, but that's what they're saying. Um, and I can't go into that this evening, but it is a fascinating area to uh, consider going into. So... Jesus comes back uh, at the head of the Muslim armies. There is, in general, uh, a presentation on who Jesus is. Now, if we were to sit down there for 75 minutes, and I've had conversations like this. I, I, even, I even linked. Uh, this is what so, it was so disappointing. Um, it was only earlier this, this year no, or late last year. I, I don't know. Once you get past 50 years, or just they just sort of flow together. But... Um, at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, I had uh, two dialogues uh, with uh, Imam Muhammad Musri. And it was sort of like that. We, we, had a, we had a podium, we spoke from the podium, and then we sat in two chairs, and you can go online and watch it. The, the Imam enjoyed it so much that we've been trying to arrange them in other cities. The only reason we haven't done them is because there have been so many terror attacks that almost every place we go to try to book a location, they want us to spend at least $10,000 in security. And we don't have that kind of money. So that's why we haven't been able to do it. But he wants to do it, and I want to do it, um, because it was done in friendship, it was done, but it wasn't done in compromise. You see, there's, there, we don't have to compromise what we believe. We just have to be honest enough and respect the other side enough to speak the truth, which means we're going to disagree. But you know what? Adults are supposed to be able to disagree without becoming offended. I realize that that doesn't work in our culture today. Uh, I realize that that is a lost art. I learned that at age seven, but um, most adults today have completely lost that and just wear their feelings on their shoulders. You offended me. I'm suing you. And uh, it's just it, it, the result is an absolute mess. It can be done. It can be done. Um, it must be done. It must be done. We, th this is the central issue. And you might say, but, but yeah, but how, does the, how could you relate a discussion of Jesus to what happened in, in France? Well, let me do it this way. Very briefly, because I've obviously addressed this subject many, many, many times before. Christians believe that Jesus was the very incarnate Son of God. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And when you look very carefully at what that verse says, it is saying in the first phrase, In the beginning was the Word, the Word's eternal. The Word was with God, that is, there is eternal relationship between the Father and the Son. Go to verse 18, God and the Son are identified there. And the word was God. And by the form of the original language that is found there, what's being emphasized is that the son is as to his nature. The logos is as to his nature, deity. He's not some mere created thing. This is an eternal relationship. John 1.14 says that that logos, that word, entered into human flesh. He truly became man. He did not cease being God. One of the key issues between us, if God created 
this world, why do you say he can't enter into this world? If he made it, why can't he enter into it? Well, because it's imperfect. Jesus wasn't imperfect. This is, this is, again, what Abdullah Kunda and I got into a great deal of depth of discussing, and I would highly recommend if you find it to be something you'd like to think more about, look up my debate with him, and you can see, especially the most valuable period was when we are dialoguing, when we're discussing with one another. That's what, that's what makes debates so useful. Uh, and I don't, think it, I don't think debate's a bad word. Well, okay. Republican debate, Democrat debate, very bad word. Um, all right. But those aren't actually debates, okay? Let's just be honest. I know what a debate is, and uh, those are not debates. Those are fashion shows. So um, <laughs> they, they are truly a, an abuse of the word debate. Um, but take a look at what, what we had said. God entered into his own creation in the person of Jesus Christ. He is described as God multiple times in the New Testament. Um, there are some Muslims who in the past have attempted to argue that the New Testament doesn't teach this. One of the most famous who has had the biggest impact in the Muslim mind around the world today um, came from South Africa. And the arguments that he presented, his name was Ahmed Didat. I never got a chance to debate Didat. I would have loved to have had the opportunity. Um, Didat's arguments you will hear from street-level Islam. So in other words, if you're talking to a Muslim who's never really had much in interaction with, with meaningful Christians and has just sort of given, been given a general understanding of Christianity, just sort of, sort of absorbed from others, it'll probably be an Ahmed Didat-level understanding. Didat was not a scholar. His arguments are grossly fallacious and highly misrepresentational. And I have been attempting to say to my Muslim friends for a long time, you really need to get rid of Didat. Um, I mean, he passed away in, I think, 2006, but his videos are still some of the most watched videos around. And his, we, have, we have taken his arguments apart so many different times, thoroughly and completely. He misrepresented the Greek in the New Testament. He, he, he just, there just many, many problems. But we have to patiently keep dealing with these things because that's, the, that's, the, that's what you're dealing with, with the vast majority of... Of, of Muslims and their argumentation. The reality is the teaching in the New Testament is very, very clear. Jesus is called our great God and Savior in Titus 2.13, our God and Savior in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And most importantly, Jesus is identified as Yahweh. He's identified as Yahweh in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, and John chapter 12, verse 41. He's identified as the one God of the Old Testament, and yet distinguished from the Father and the Son. This is why you have to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity because the doctrine of the Trinity is based upon three biblical revelations. There's only one true God. There are three persons who are distinguished from one another in the New Testament, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet the New Testament teaches the deity of each one of those three persons. You've got to deal with the reality of the person of Jesus Christ. And I have often said the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed in that space between the last verse of Malachi and the first verse of Matthew. And some people say, you're saying it's not in the Bible. No, what I'm saying is that the doctrine of the Trinity was revealed in history, specifically in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. All the New Testament was written after that. So the revelation in history took place 400 years after Malachi and about 20 or 30 years before the first book of the New Testament, maybe 20. That's when the revelation took place. And so what the New Testament reflects is the reality of what God has done in the incarnation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter was an experiential Trinitarian. He had walked with the Son. He had heard the Father speaking in the Mount of Transfiguration. He was now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so the ease with which the New Testament can use Trinitarian phrases, the ease with which the New Testament writers can speak about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, in the, same, in the very same verse, the very same sentence, shows that they're not trying to explain something new. This is already their reality. You know, when I write to friends of mine who are fellow cyclists, uh, right now the Tour de France is on, okay? And that's the Super Bowl for cyclists, you know, uh, each, each year in July. And so when, uh, when I write to uh, a friend of mine who's a cyclist, I don't have to include 
in every email to him a glossary of the terms that we share as a part of our experience as cyclists. I can make an easy reference to drivers who are texting and trying to kill us. I do not have to explain what a car is and what texting is or why this would be dangerous to a cyclist or anything else because we share that in common. And so we can just use phrases easily without having to explain everything. That's exactly what you have in the New Testament when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity. That's why you have all these passages where you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, over, over 60 of them in the New Testament. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit associated one together, which would make no sense at all if the New Testament writers were actually saying what, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses are saying. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses believe in Jehovah God, and Jesus is Michael the Archangel, and the Spirit's not even a person. So you think about Matthew chapter 28, baptizing them in the name of Jehovah God, Michael the Archangel, and an impersonal active force. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's great. Yeah, that's lovely. Uh, certainly, that's exactly what, what was being intended. No, of course not. And so there doesn't have to be these creedal statements. I mean, there are some. I mean, 1 Corinthians 8 is about as close as you can get. When you take the Shema and expand it out to include Jesus, that sort of tells you a little something about the mindset of the apostles. But that's what the New Testament reflects to us, is the reality of the church and the experience of what they themselves know of who Jesus was and the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're now indwelt by the Spirit of God. And so here's the point. The Quran says in Surah 5 that we are to, uh, we the people of the gospel, are to judge by what is contained in the gospel. Now, I've been given all sorts of interpretations of Surah 5 by my Muslim friends. Uh, but the point is this. When those words were given by Muhammad, the gospel still existed in the possession of the Christian people, or the words are meaningless. They're meaningless. How can you say, judge by the gospel, at the same time you're saying, I'm sorry, but you don't have the gospel? Judge by something you don't have? Doesn't make any sense. Clearly, the author of the Quran believed that the Injil still existed in 632 AD. Well, here's the problem we know exactly what the New Testament looked like in 632. We have many manuscripts that long predate 632. Uh, I'm doing a major uh, project right now, years-long project right now, on one of those manuscripts, manuscript P45. Um, so we, we know what the gospel was. And so according to the Quran, we're to judge by that. And when we judge by that, we have to find the author of the Quran did not understand what we believe. Now, think about something with me, folks. Whether the, put aside the issue of whether the Trinity is true or false. Put, put that issue aside. Did God know what the Trinity was in 632 AD? Of course he did. All the, all the councils were done. All the Christological controversies were a thing of the past. God knew what it was. Whether Muhammad understood it or not, even from the Islamic perspective, would be irrelevant. If God wanted to give a refutation of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Quran, he could do it in 632, whether Muhammad understood it or not. So why isn't there a meaningful, accurate refutation of the doctrine of the Trinity? Instead, we have, do not say three. Three what? Every single time the Quran says, do not say three, the very next phrase is, there is only one God. So, if, you know, let me use Alma from last night as an example. I'm not sure if he'll appreciate this. But he kept making statements about that other school. You know, the one down that away, I think. Um, and uh, uh, it would be sort of like if, 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 if Alma said, do not say two. There's only one. Well, what would he be talking about? It's not BYU and Utah. There's only one. It's Utah. So what he's saying, when you, he wouldn't have to say, do not say two universities. There's only one university. That would be understood. Well, when the Quran says, do not say three, there's only one God. Well, what's it saying you were, we're actually saying? It's saying we're saying there's three what? Gods. 
The author of the Quran thinks we're polytheists. The author of the Quran thinks we're saying there are three gods. We're not saying there are three gods. We don't believe that. Well, does the Quran ever identify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No, in fact, the Islamic understanding of who the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Ghost, is the angel Jibreel. So where in the Quran do you ever have three defined for you? One place. One place. And I'll even use the official. Uh, like I said, this is, this is an excellent translation. Even though I don't know why they didn't use modern English. They, it, it almost sounds like the King James, uh, which is sort of odd. Uh, but anyway, uh, Surah 5. Surah 5. Aya 119, and unfortunately we still need our progressive lenses here. Surah 5, 119. God said, this is the day wherein the truthful shall benefit from their truthfulness. Wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry, 116, there we go. And when God said, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto mankind, take me and my mother as gods apart from God? He said, Glory be to thee. It is not for me to utter that to which I have no right. Had I said it, you would have surely known it. You know what is in myself, and I know not what is in thyself. Truly it is you who knows best the things unseen. So, so listen to what I said again. On the day of judgment, God is going to say, O Jesus, Allah is going to say to Jesus, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to mankind, take me and my mother as gods apart from Allah? says to Jesus, did you take me and my mother as gods apart from Allah? There's your three. Allah, Mary, Jesus. Where would something like that come from? May I make a suggestion? And to see, this would be something that would be so wonderful to discuss. I'd like to know how the imam would respond to this. And it would help you to hear how the imam would respond to this. That's why I'm so disappointed. But may I make a suggestion? Muhammad, we know from historical sources, accepted by Muslims generally, went on caravan up into Syria a number of times in his life. And if you're, say, a 15-year-old guy, and you go into a Christian village in Syria... And, uh, you know, the camels are being watered and fed. you got a little time. You think you're just going to sit around, stand there watching the camels? No, you can get as far away from those camels as you can. And so you're going to go exploring, go looking around. And so if you, as a 15-year-old from Mecca, saw a Christian church. Now, a Christian church in Syria in 585 A.D. is not going to be a huge edifice. But it is going to have some identifying marks. And so if you go in or if you even sort of stick your head in and do a little looking around, what are you going to see? Well, it's late 6th century. There's probably going to be some statuary by that point in time. And you're probably going to have God represented in various ways as creator. Uh... Definitely going to have crucifixes by that point in time. Going to have a man on a cross. You might have some doves, but that's not going to say anything to some guy from the desert, especially who's never read the New Testament, right? But what are you going to have a lot of? A woman. Mary is already being highly exalted at this point in time. And what's she going to have in her arms? A baby. So you've got the creator. You've got a woman. You've got a baby who ends up on a cross up there. And you're coming from a polytheistic Mecca where there's gods who have sons and daughters by the tons. So how are you going to interpret that? What's that going to suggest to you? Sounds like Surah 5, 116. O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to mankind, take me and my, God, my mother as gods apart from God? There's the three. That's not what we believe. It is intriguingly what the Mormons believe. 
So, so I, I have a couple of times suggested to some of my, my Muslim friends, that one thing you could do with this is make it a prophetic refutation of, of, of Mormonism, uh, if you'd like to do that. Um, but none of them have thought that was a really good idea. So they really haven't gone in that direction. But, um, we have to have a conversation about what the author of the Quran understood. Does the Quran accurately represent the groups that it says are going into hellfire? Because that happens to be me and my wife and my children and my grandchildren. I think it's sort of important. And I've shown enough respect to the Muslim to know exactly what this book says to me. And so it is an act of respect back to have a meaningful conversation. Not to compromise. Not to sit around and say, well, we did, all we can talk about is all the stuff that we have in common. We do have things in common. In fact, I'm about to say something that's going to shock everybody in this room and wake most of you up at the same time. I have said this many times, but at the University of Utah, this will be an interesting way of, uh, this will be the most interesting context in which I've said it. Islam is closer to biblical Christianity than Mormonism ever could be. You know why? Because the most fundamental defining factor of religion is whether you believe there is one true creator God or whether you don't. Islam believes there's one true creator God. So they are monotheists like Christians are. If you were here last night, Mormonism does not believe that by any stretch of the imagination. It is a massively polytheistic faith. And so on the most definitional foundation, Islam is closer to biblical Christianity than Mormonism ever could be because Mormonism is polytheistic. So is it not the case that I can read entire sections of the Quran and go, that sounds like Isaiah. One God, creator of all things, foolishness of, of idolatry, foolishness of polytheism, you bet. But here's the question. Did the author of the Quran understand what was in the Christian scriptures? And the answer is no. Why not? If it was inscribed by God on tablets in heaven, didn't God know what was in the New Testament? Of course he did. This then becomes, these become the foundational issues that we must discuss if we are going to have any meaningful progress in our dialogue with one another. It can be done respectfully. It could have been done respectfully this evening, but it didn't happen. And I hope, I hope maybe that the imam will watch this and go, you know what? Should have been there. Let's do it. Let's do it sometime in the future. Are we ready? All right. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how should we... That is the coolest walking stick I've ever seen. That is so neat. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, how should we uh, be... What terminology should we use to refer to hell? And why uh, was purgatory uh, an inappropriate... Uh, well, uh, I, I've said many times, the, the Islamic sources have far more graphic and detailed descriptions of hellfire than anything even Dante came up with. Uh, and certainly anything than is found in, in the Christian scriptures, Old or New Testament. There's a tremendous amount of, uh, if you read the Hadith, over and over again, stuff about the fire. There's this, it's what's called the Sarat, the bridge that you have to cross over and if you fall off, you go into the fire. This is, oh, it's 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 an amazingly large amount of discussion, some of which is 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 sort of frightening, um, but uh, I, there's there's really not an issue of uh, of terminology difference at that point. The reason I said it's not really purgatory is because purgatory in Roman Catholic theology has a specific meaning. It's only for those who are in a state of grace but need to be purged of the temporal punishments of sins. And so it's, it's different fundamentally than hellfire itself, whereas in most of the Islamic eschatology, uh, those who even will be taken out of the fire and brought into paradise, it's still the same fire that everyone else is in. So it's not like some... It, 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 there is no concept of temporal punishments and things like that. It's not like there's a 
prescribed period of time. It's really more based upon how much faith someone had. Uh, but there's much more um, background to the Roman Catholic concept of temporal punishments, indulgences, merit, and so forth. That's not a, uh, Muhammad didn't have any understanding of that. So that doesn't really enter into, uh, in my reading, enter into the understanding of that. And in fact, there are Muslims who disagree. There are Muslims who don't believe that, that Muslims themselves will ever go into hell. So I'm just simply saying you can make a pretty strong argument, and there are many Muslims who do believe uh, that there will be that period of time. Trying to, look, this is one of the, ma- this is one of the major issues, folks. I, having read as much of the Islamic material as I have, I recognize it's not a consistent body of material. And that's why you have different groups. That's why you have ISIS has their, their things, their quotes that they use, and the people who oppose ISIS have theirs. And, and there, My concern is that I can't see how there can be an Islamic Reformation because the source documents to which they must turn are simply not coherent and consistent enough to come up with a coherent, consistent system. That's my concern. Um, and that would be a great subject for discussion, uh, but can't. Wow. Yes, sir. 50 <laughs> words or less, please. <laughs> I think I can do it. Is the typical Muslim response to the New Testament that the disciples actually didn't know who Jesus was claiming to be or that the, their writings have been so corrupted over time that we don't know what the disciples actually said. The, the disciples, the true, the true disciples of Jesus were all Muslims. And so uh, many Muslims uh, will, will buy into the idea that the Ebionites were the original, actually the original followers of Jesus. Um, and the big baddie is Paul. Paul is, oh, man. Uh, there's, there's a lot of anti-Paul books out there. And the Muslims grab hold of them and use them all the time. And so Paul corrupted all that stuff. And exactly when or how, you're never told. Uh, and, of course, it conflicts with the Surah 5, you know, judged by what's in the gospel. Well, if it was corrupted before then, that doesn't make any sense, so on and so forth. But, but the general idea is, uh, yeah, what you, anything you find in the New Testament... Uh, that is in conflict with the Quran is a corruption. Anything that can be interpreted consistently with the Quran uh, has survived somehow. So you can go to John 14 and John 16, and the coming comforter is Muhammad. So John 14 and 16 are okay. John 1, John 17, all the places about the deity of Christ, not okay. So it, it, they're, they're, you know, obviously one of my main arguments uh, in, in debates has been you don't have a consistent way of approaching this information. You use one standard for the New Testament, you use a different standard for the Quran, uh, and you can't do that. And I think that's a valid argument. I really do. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so I engaged uh, or was chatting with a lady just last week. Um, we were talking about Islam. And she says, I've, I read the Quran. Uh, the Quran has specific texts um, that are very clearly refer to militaristic activity. The non uh, the non militaristic Muslim today will say they had a particular context that must be observed. For example, Surah Nine, which is probably the last Surah revealed, at least in traditionally, talks about warfare against uh, the unbelievers, uh, fight them until they pay the jizya, so on and so forth. One, these are the key texts that ISIS and others use as the foundation for what they do. Now, we as Christians need to be very careful here because maybe you haven't read the Old Testament in a while, but There are sections in Deuteronomy about wiping out the Midianites and the Amorites. Man, woman, and child don't even leave the doggies alive, okay? And we demand the right to contextualize those things, to say we're talking about the time when the children of Israel were going into a land. They're being used to bring judgment of God against the Amorites who were an evil people. 
Uh, this is not the New Covenant era. This is the Old Covenant era. There is a context. We demand the right to do all of those things, and appropriately so. And yet, in my experience, there are many sound evangelicals who, because you see these terrible things, you know that, the, that ISIS is doing terrible things to Christians in Syria. You forget all that and say, well, there's, it's right there in the Quran. It's just as plain as can be. And yet there are all sorts of Muslims that would say, but, but that's not, ISIS is misusing that. Just as we would say, if, someone, if some, some Christian set off a car bomb, outside a government building and said, I'm just doing what Moses commanded me to do in destroying the Amorites, we'd go, you nut. And yet when the Muslims say that to the guy who drives a truck into a whole crowd and says, you nut, we go, ah, you're all the same. Are we being consistent there? Now, I understand that that guy who did what he did has a particular theological understanding. And I'd like to cheer for the people that are arguing against that particular theological understanding within Islam. And this brings us back to the last question, and this is my concern is, there isn't, I don't believe, a consistency amongst the sources that allows one side to absolutely win. But there's no question of this. When Islam produced a great society, which it did for a number of hundreds of years, great learning, uh, very stable, et cetera, et cetera, it developed a legal system that had restraints upon jihad and put very strong strictures upon the interpretation of those texts. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and these others reject all of that. They've thrown it out of the way, and it's fact. It's the mindset of ISIS and Al-Qaeda that ended up destroying that Islamic civilization. Are there still Muslims who think like that old Islamic civilization? There are. There are. They are out there. They do condemn this stuff. I don't care if Sean Hannity ignores them completely. They do. I know them. I can just send them an email. Could you send me some articles? And they're there. They just never get any, they just never get any press. They don't have the money that the other, other groups have. I know they're there. And if we don't make the distinction, we become hypocrites. Now, are there Muslims who refuse to make the distinction between us? Yes. Does that mean it's unfair? Yes. We're Christians. We should be used to it. If we follow him who is the truth, we don't have any choice here. We have to make the distinction, even if they will not do it to us. We have to extend it. That's what grace is. That's our calling. That's our calling. So, uh, now, okay, I, I, I've, I've addressed that, that, that one before. Uh, yes, sir. So, you said that there's, with the Muslim faith, there's a lot of inconsistencies, uh, and that there's different people. I, I, I said that the, in, the, in the sources, the Hadith, things like that, there's, there, there, it's not a consistent body of revelation, um, and that leads to the different schools of jurisprudence and the, and the differences in practice and theology that we see today, yes. Great, that answers my question. Okay, all right. Well, and there are, by the way, the major, you know, 90% of the world's Muslims, approximately, 85 to 90, are Sunni. About 10, 9 to 10% are Shiite. That is a, there's a whole other story behind why that, that exists. That's primarily in regards to succession, in the caliphate, it goes way, way, way back, and it's had fascinating theological stuff. I mean, it, within Shiite Islam, there's actually a concept of substitutionary atonement, but it's because of, a, of the wiping out of a certain family at a point in time. So it's fascinating to look at, um, but that's a different thing because the Shiites have different, they have different hadith. They have the same Quran, but they have different hadith and things like that. So that, that's a little bit different, but amongst the Sunnis, even the sources they use, I don't find to be consistent, and that's why you have all the differences, yeah. Yes, sir. So that story you told in the beginning about the man who killed 99 yep. men and then killed the priest, is that considered by them a parable or a true story? Well, it's, one of the, it's part of the Hadith. And so um, you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't have to believe that it historically happened. But since Muhammad taught it, then the, the truths communicated by it. Uh, are are authoritative for a Sunni Muslim. Yeah. Yes, sir. See, you only went like that. That's, I, that's. Are there similarities between saying the Shahada and saying the sinner's prayer? And is there a concept of regeneration within uh, Islam? 
Man, I wish I had my digital projector in my presentation because one of the things I normally do is I start off showing people taking the Shahada at a, what can only be called an Islamic altar call in Sydney, Australia from only a few years ago. And the, what, I love watching the audience as they watch this happening because on the one hand, there's all these parallels. People coming forward, they're being encouraged by the audience. Uh, the speaker is saying, come forward. They're coming very similar to this. They're, they're lining up along uh, the thing uh, in front of the stage. They are given copies of the Quran and books about Muhammad. So they're given discipleship gifts. Uh, and then they're led in the Shahada. Now, they have to be led in the Shahada because you have to say it in Arabic. And so he says it, you know, la, la, and they repeat after him, and he, he walks them through the whole thing, and then everybody applauds wildly, and, and so on and so forth. But then it's the differences that make people uncomfortable, too. The guys are wearing the same dress that Muhammad would have worn in the 7th century. Uh, I always like to ask the audience, how many of you made your profession of faith in Christ in either biblical Hebrew or Koine Greek? And I normally have one seminarian someplace. You know, some geek. You know, that type of thing. Um, uh, but uh, I, I lay out the similarities and then the differences. And one of the main differences to see in light of the fact that you have to even make the confession in the language of Muhammad is that Islam never had its own Acts chapter 15. Now, if you remember Acts chapter 15, that's the Jerusalem Council. And at the Jerusalem Council, it was decided that you didn't have to become Jewish before you became a Christian. In other words, because of Acts chapter 15, the gospel can go out to the whole world. And it transcends all the boundaries. It transcends all of the languages uh, you can make your profession of faith in any language whatsoever. You don't have to have the dress and the trappings. And, and, and Islam never had that. And so it brings that culture with it. And that's what's causing so many of the problems today. So there are similarities. And then there are some real major differences. As to regeneration, no. Because there is no concept of spiritual death. Uh, there is no concept of total depravity. There is concept of sin and punishment for sin. But... Um, and there are divisions between Muslims in regards to Qadr and uh, whether, and the whole concept of predestination. They have their own argument about that. Um, but there is no concept of total depravity, of nature, binding of the will, uh, bondage of the will, anything like that. And so anyone can simply choose to repent and do what's right in God's sight. There doesn't need to be a regeneration and dwelling by his spirit, new creation, anything like that. No. Let's do two more. Yes, sir. Do Muslims have a, an idea of bodily resurrection? And uh, what kind of uh, doctrine would you say they have of in, human nature? I think you touched a little bit on the moral nature, but just the other aspects of human nature. What sort of doctrine of humanity? Yes, it is, a, uh, it is a physical resurrection. It's not merely a spiritual resurrection. And... Um, they believe that we, they will not utilize the term uh, image of God because that borders on some kind of idolatry that, that has a shirky sound to it. Um, but they do believe uh, that we are born upon fitna. Not, not fitna. No, it is fitna. The point is that there was a mythak that was taken from us, a, a covenant that was taken from us. According to the story, um, God rubbed Adam's back and all of his progeny issued forth from him and we all stood upon this great plain. And God made a covenant with us and said, am I not your Rab, your Lord? And we said, you are our Lord. And so we made a covenant with the law in Adam. So, sort of a federal headship concept. And so we are born with an innate knowledge of God's existence. We are actually born as Muslims. And in fact, what ISIS and Al-Qaeda do, their idea is, since you're born as a Muslim, if you become anything else, you're now an apostate, and the penalty for apostasy is death, and therefore you don't have to worry about killing innocent people, because there are no innocent people. Uh, that's how they get around that. 
Um, and so you're, you're born uh, the fitra. Fitra, not fitna. That's what it is. Fitna is conflict. Fitra is the, this knowledge, which interestingly enough is very parallel to our understanding of the image of God and the suppression of the knowledge of God, katakanto in, in, in Romans 1.18. There's, there's, I've, got a, I've got a little discussion of this in my book on the Quran. There is an interesting parallel that can be found there um, uh, between them. So there is this idea that we have this innate knowledge, but it goes back to a covenant made with Adam, not so much to our created nature uh, as such, though our unity with Adam is, is, is affirmed by that. Yeah. Yes, sir, one more. Oh, yeah, and I couldn't even begin to delineate them for you. But I, and I didn't know this. I was at a sort of secret meeting of scholars on Islam once, and uh, one of the guys was giving a paper on um, the fact that in, at book bazaars and fairs in Islamic countries, there are, the number of books published on eschatology, huge. And if they're all saying the same thing, you wouldn't have a huge number of them being published. So, yeah, there's all sorts of camps and views and it makes all of our premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, panmillennial, whatever millennial uh, stuff look look like child's play. Yeah, there's a lot of different uh, camps and understandings that I wouldn't even. I don't even like talking about Christian eschatology, let alone <laughs> Islamic eschatology. So uh, there's there's no way to to be a winner on that. So I hope that my, my desire for all of you, my desire for believers. I am, let, let me just say this in closing, I am very, very concerned about the attitude that I see amongst many of my fellow believers, conservative, Bible-believing Christians who've learned more about Islam from Fox News than they have from solid, meaningful theological sources. I see a bias and a prejudice amongst my fellow Christians against Muslims that means that there's no way that person was ever going to put their heart out there to actually present the gospel in love to the Muslim people because they're afraid of them. This concerns me greatly. Um, I never thought that, that this would be something that I would be taking the lead in, but God has given me an opportunity of being places I never thought I'd be. One week to the day after the Benghazi consulate attack, I was debating a young Muslim man in the East London Mosque which is the largest mosque in Europe. And in fact, if you saw the last little brief reboot of the series 24, the opening scene was of the East London Mosque. I could see the very room I was in. Uh, one week, while the riots were taking place around the world, one week later uh, at the East London Mosque, I never expected to be there. They did not have a description for this in career day uh, when I was in college, no. <laughs> did not have that. I've learned to love these people. I've learned to pray for these people. They need Christians who know what they believe and will speak the truth in love and will not be filled with fear. But if we are going, if we're going to do this truthfully, we can't be inconsistent. We can't be bigots. If we demand that people allow us to define our faith, then we've got to do the exact same thing for them. We have to. If we don't do that, we are not truly following after Christ. So please, don't just take this information and store it away someplace like ammunition for the day when you're going to go to battle. Um, use this information and say, Lord, how can, how can you use me? How can you use me? And my true hope and prayer is that the recordings of this, uh, whoever tried to blacklist it, whoever tried to destroy it, my true prayer is that the Muslim Student Association, uh, the, uh, the local imam, the, the Muslim center, that they'll watch these and they'll go, we should have been there. Should have been there. Uh, here are people who cl clearly care about what they believe and care about us. And hopefully the next time we won't have two empty chairs. Uh, and I won't just be standing here talking. So uh, let's close the word of prayer. Is that all right? 
Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the freedom we still have to discuss these things in this land. We do not know how long we will have this freedom, but as long as we have it, may we use it to your honor and glory. We do pray for the Muslim people. We pray for ourselves that you would fill our hearts with a love for you, for your gospel, and therefore a love for those who need to hear that gospel. And you would cause us to be truthful and honest and careful in what we say about others. Give us that opportunity, Lord. We do thank you for this evening. We ask you to continue to bless this conference as our focus will be upon you and upon your truth. We thank you for uh, the gift you've given to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us peace with you. May we truly treasure it, we pray in Christ's name.